All right. How we doing today? We doing good? Hello? Yeah, we're doing good. All right, good. Uh, we've got a Bible. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 2 today. Uh, we've got a ton to cover. So first service was wild because I went through literally at, like all 50 verses. I am not doing that this service. Uh, it was just too much. But uh, oh my boy, Johnny in the house over here. What's up, baby? Sorry, sorry. I don't mean to point you out. Uh, uh, if you've got a Bible, though, uh, Daniel chapter 2, we're going to kind of just jump right into it because uh, 50 verses, if I were to spend three minutes on each verse, that's two and a half hours. Ain't nobody got time for that. So um, all right, so a uh, recap. The book of Daniel was written about 2,600 years ago. It takes place about 2,600 years ago. It's kind of a, um, a biography of Daniel, uh, written by Daniel, a journal of Daniel. Uh, and it's really about God's people being attacked uh, by the Babylonian Empire and then sent to live in exile uh, about 700 miles away from where uh, they all grew up. And what we learned last week was that uh, all throughout Scripture, Babylon is used as this symbol, right? This symbol uh, to describe this spirit that seems to be behind everything that opposes God and his kingdom. Uh, Meaning, behind the Babylonian Empire is a spirit that has always sought to combat and to harm and to to divide God's people. Jesus even makes the statement that there's an enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So I've come to bring life and life abundantly. And so Daniel is about really God's people living in a society that in many ways uh, is, um, is being influenced by a spirit that wants to oppose God's people. So in Daniel chapter 1, which we went over last week, which if you weren't here, I highly recommend. I never do like you know, hey, go listen to my message. I don't do, I'm not that guy, right? Like, so, but in order for Daniel to make sense, so much was covered in, in, in week one. So I would encourage you to go check out week one, uh, which is on YouTube. But in Daniel chapter one, we met a few specific characters that I'll go over uh, again, uh, because we're going to see them again in chapter two. And so you got this dude named, named King Nebuchadnezzar, right? And so kind of like in my notes, as I was writing, Nebuchadnezzar is such a long word, I kept calling him Nebi. So I might do that today. But uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, right, he's the king of Babylon, and um, he had just seized Israel. And then what, from there you have these four royal Jewish um, uh, teenagers who have been captured. They are considered to be smart and competent and skilled. There even goes out of the, the Bible even goes out of the way to say that they were good looking. Praise God for that. Uh, their names were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azra, but uh, they got renamed Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these four young dudes uh, were sent to the Babylonian college or university or schooling system to be deprogrammed of their Jewish upbringing and all the things that mom and dad taught them as they were being raised up. Uh, They want to kind of deprogram that, deconstruct that, and then re-educate them in Babylonian culture uh, as what's considered wise men. And it was going to take about three years of schooling for them to do that. And so last week in chapter one, we looked at these specific strategies that this ancient uh, spirit or these ancient strategies um, have always kind of existed and have been used to kind of attack and oppose God's people. And I'll run through them really, really quickly. The first one we saw was that the spirit divides God's people. Wants to unite them everywhere else, but divide God's people. And as followers of Jesus, it's super important to remember, uh, specifically around like an election time or when society is getting a little bit crazy where it wants to divide us in every area, whether it be around socioeconomic or race or nationality or ethnicity, all that stuff, that as the people of God, right? Our allegiance is first and foremost to Jesus and his kingdom, right? And what we ought to fight for more than anything else is to fight to stay united with one another more than we fight for any type of ideology outside of that. Make sense? Some of y'all could be like, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Right. That's important. So that was first. Second is this, that this spirit wants to shut down God's church, right? In the days of Daniel, one of the very first things that the Babylonians did was they... excuse me, invaded Jerusalem and then stole the valuables out of the temple and destroyed the temple. Satan's goal has always been to shut down God's people by shutting down God's church, right? So uh, that's why you see so many scandals within churches, so many moral failures, so many pandemics. There is a direct attack against God's people to shut the church, right? I I told you last week, I think that was one of COVID's primary things. Right, was to try to get the people of God to stop getting together. And that was more than that, but I think that was a part of it. Third thing we see is this. This spirit wants to educate future generations in its ways. Right, Daniel and his buddies, they're hand-selected 
picked to be educated as the king's wise men and then have their beliefs deconstructed and new ones reconstructed based on their Babylonian worldview. And today that same thing seems to be happening, right? The best educational facilities and and institutions seem to be wanting to gather the smartest people and integrate them into society after they've educated them so that they can go ahead and uh, create a culture and kind of push forward a culture that is against and opposes God's kingdom. Very clear. Fourth thing we saw last week was the spirit wants to relabel us, wants us to relabel us, right? In the same way that Daniel and his friends were given new names, the same spirit wants to kind of get us to relabel ourselves and see ourselves outside of uh, God's image and likeness in any other way, right? So it wants you to see yourself as a hooper or a, a creative, or it wants you to see yourself as an athlete of some sort or a musician. Just label yourself under the banner of something other than you're created in the image and likeness of God, right? Identify yourself by your profession. I'm a manager. I'm a teacher. You know, I'm a banker. I'm a contractor or a hobby or a family role. I'm a mom. I'm a dad. I'm a stay-at-home mom. I'm a stay-at-home dad. I'm a breadwinner. Or identify yourself by social status, single, married, cheating, not cheating, was cheated on. You know what I'm saying? Like, or it could be even deeper than that, political ideologies. I'm left, I'm right, I'm conservative, I'm liberal, I'm progressive, I'm woke, I ain't woke. Like, whatever it is, it could be beyond that. It could be sexual preference, bi, straight, uh, try, everything. Uh, uh, Keep going, right? Like, it's just, there's so many things, right? It could be a pronoun. I won't even start, right? It doesn't matter, though, how you identify. As long as it's not rooted in the truth that we are made by God, sustained by God, we resemble the image of God, and one day we will stand before God, then it's good. Identify with anything else, okay? All right, the fifth thing was this, the spirit always wants this, not the spirit of God, this spirit that exists behind, right, these kind of, this this thing that's pushing this society, it always wants to emasculate men and distort sexuality. I was hesitant with this one, but I had to go there. Daniel and his friends were under the influence and care of a eunuch, the chief eunuch, who was surgically castrated, okay? Why emasculate men and distort sexuality? Why? Why would that be such a tactic? It's easy. The easiest way to eradicate a godly lineage is to mess with the bloodline. It's easy. That's how you do it. It happened before Genesis, in Genesis chapter 6 where they, you get this crazy story where these <clears throat> fallen angels seem to be trying to impregnate impregnate human women, right? Why? To stop the lineage of Christ from coming, right? And then after that, and God's like, you ain't doing that no more, sends a flood, things get crazy. It has always been the primary tactic to stop, uh, to, to, to kind of end godly lineage is to emasculate men, distort sexuality, normalize casual sex in order to create a generation that's lacking parents in a covenantal relationship and to disrupt God's vision for the family structure. When you do that, you can really screw things up, right? I mean, right now, many of us in this room are a product of that, right? I mean, that's my story. Right now, we are among the most fatherless generations in which dads did not die in war. Tonight, 40% of children in America will go to bed without a dad in their home. Those kids are eight times more likely to go to jail, five times more likely to commit suicide, 30 times more likely to run away from home, 10 times more likely to abuse a substance, which is why, okay, which is why even on Mother's Day, it's so important to celebrate the family structure and moms, right? Why? Because moms have had to carry a huge load. As society has led men to believe that they don't have to be responsible, they believe the lie that they're not important, that they're not actually needed in the home outside of maybe making some money and putting a roof over somebody's head. And it's a lie. I mean, every man that you see in every sitcom on TV is a doofus. He's an idiot. He's dumb. He's not a model man. They eliminate, they're trying to eliminate any sort of masculinity out of society right now. Right? And what it, what it will be the product of that? What we have. Okay. So, straight out of Daniel 1, we see these strategies as a spirit that opposes God and his people and wants to disrupt God's kingdom. All right, <clears throat> that's chapter 1. Sorry that took so long. It was like eight minutes. Now, the book of Daniel isn't about a Jewish prophet named Daniel. It's about two kingdoms. You have one dominating kingdom, the kingdom of God, and then you have this opposing kingdom that is yet to acknowledge the fact that it is being dominated. 
right? And in chapter 1, where it was about the spirit of Babylon, or what the Apostle Paul calls the dominion of darkness, right? Today in chapter 2, we're going to get a glimpse of the kingdom of God and its attributes. And so, like I said, 50 verses, we don't have time for that, but I'm going to do my best to run through this. I would love for you, if you got a Bible app or something like that, to open it up. If you have a Bible in, like, in your hand, open it up to Daniel chapter 2. If you don't, that's totally fine as well. No harm, no foul. I told them not to put this on the screen simply because I'm going to be jumping around all over the place because 50 verses is too much to go through. And so if you have something that you can follow along with me, that's great. If you don't, that's totally fine too. Just listen. All right? I'm going to do my very best. I need you to stay with me. I'm going to go fast, kind of like an auctioner hopped up on coffee and Adderall, which I might be. So we're going to get this done, all right? Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In the second year of King Nebuchadnezzar, so Daniel and his buddies are in their second year of this schooling, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, or dreams it says. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. He's freaked out, he's had this dream, he's having these dreams and he can't sleep. Then the king commanded the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, <clears throat> these are the spiritual elites, right, to, to come in and tell him his dream. So they stood before the king, the king said, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Now, we don't know if he forgot the dream. I don't know if you've ever had a dream before. You're like, what was that about? That was a little, uh, that was a little weird, right? I, I don't know what it was about. I can't even fully remember it, but I'm freaked out. I don't, so we don't know if he's actually trying to mess with these people, and he, can't rem- and he can remember it, but he's testing them, or if he just can't remember it. We don't really know. Then the Chaldeans said, tell your servants the dream, and we'll show the interpretation. <laughs> the king's like this. The word for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you're going to be torn limb from limb and your houses are going to be laid to ruins. That's tough. But if you show me the dream and its interpretation, you'll receive gifts and honor. Verse 10, the Chaldeans answered, there's not a man on earth who can do that, for no king has asked such a thing. Verse 12, because of this, the king was furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions who were in school to be wise men to be killed as well. And so basically Nebuchadnezzar's like, listen, you come in, I'm a little freaked out, I'm having a bad day, it's been a few, a few bad sleepless nights, I'm having this dream, I need you to interpret it. But in order for me to actually trust that you could interpret it, tell me my dream. They're like, ah, ah, King Nebi, that's not how this works, you know? Like, you tell me the dream, I'll interpret it. He's like, nope, no, 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 no. We ain't playing this game no more. You tell me my dream. No? Kill him. It's like, dang, okay. All right. Verse 16. Daniel requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. And Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to his boys, Hananiah, Mishael, Ezra, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that, this, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men. Right? Daniel's like, okay, we got to go and do this. He's given us this amount of time. Let's go try to like, seek the Lord on this. Verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. Verse 23 says, To you, O God, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have made known to me what we asked of you. And then uh, Arioch, who was kind of like the the hit man for the king, brought Daniel before the king and said, I have found among the exiles this dude, a Judah, uh, from Judah, a man who will make known the interpretation. So the king then asked Daniel, are you able to make known both the dream and its interpretation? And Daniel answers like this. This is dope. He says, no wise men enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. What do you mean, can I give you the dream and the interpretation? No man can do that. Long pause. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. First off, this kid's a teenager. Just swagger, right? You going to tell me? 
am I going to tell you? <laughs> no one can tell you. But I know God in heaven. You don't know him. I know him. Watch this. Woo! I love it. I, I, you got to love. First off, you got to love the hood in the Bible every once in a while, right? You just got to love it. It's hard for me. I kind of grew up a little bit in the hood in, in Jersey, right? And so it's hard for me to not read the scriptures kind of like I'm in the hood, right? Like, like, like Daniel's in the hood. He got called up. He's like, yo, tell me the dream. He's like, watch. I got this, yo. It's just so funny. There's a God in heaven who wants to give you a heads up of what is to come. Your dream is this, verse 31. A great image, right? Mighty and of exceeding brightness stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. Nebi's like, yeah. The head was of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly iron, partly clay. As you looked, a stone was come out, came out with no, from no human hand. It was just cut out out of nowhere, and it struck the image on its feet and of iron clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, clay, bronze, silver, and the gold were broken into pieces, but the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 36, this was the dream. And Nebi's like, oh, I remember that. Yep, that's the dream. And he says, all right. Now we're going to give you the interpretation. We most likely being Daniel and his three friends. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory. You are the head of gold. Another, another kingdom inferior to you, though, right? One that's weaker than you shall arise after you. Somebody's coming behind you. Strong as iron that shall, uh, 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 no, I, I missed my place. Thank you the bronze one, they shall rise after you in a third kingdom which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom as well, strong as iron, that shall crush all these. And as you saw the feet and the toes, partly clay, partly iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. Now, real quick, real quick, for you, you, all my Bible nerds in here, all right? So I know we got some Bible nerds in here. Some of you are like, I don't even know what a nerd is or what the Bible is, right? Cool, you could just, don't worry about this for a minute. <clears throat> my Bible nerds, though, when you read verses like this, there's this temptation to overinterpret the interpretation. God gave the interpretation to Daniel. Daniel is giving the interpretation to the king. There is no need for us who are Bible nerds, I'm a Bible nerd, I love it, to overinterpret their interpretation. Does that make sense? The only kingdom that's clearly defined is the head of gold, which is Babylon, and ahead of that is Nebuchadnezzar. But the second kingdom, the third kingdom, they're barely mentioned. A lot of Christians try to speculate what these other kingdoms are. Oh, oh, silver represents the Persian Empire, and then uh, bronze represents the Greeks, and uh, then the iron is represented by Rome and, and their empire. And, and those are all cool assumptions, maybe. But if God wanted you to have more interpretation, it would have been given to you. So be careful, because that could be dangerous. So if overinterpretation isn't the point, what is the point? Well, here it is, verse 44. Here's the point. <clears throat> In the days of those other kingdoms, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. And that kingdom shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all other kingdoms and bring them to an end. And it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and it broke every other kingdom into pieces. The point of the dream is that there is a kingdom that is to come. And this kingdom, right, will break all the other kingdoms. This kingdom will put all other kingdoms in its place in the end. And that kingdom is God's kingdom. And Daniel closes out with these words. A great God has made this known to the king. What shall be after this? After your reign, this is what's going to happen. The dream is certain and its interpretation true, is true. And then watch Nebi's response. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, paid homage to Daniel, commanded uh, uh, an offering, an incense be offered to him. And which for some reason, Daniel didn't seem like, hey, listen, we don't do that in the Christian world. He's like, all right, you're going to pay homage. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly your God is God of gods, Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the, God gave, then the king gave Daniel high honors, great gifts, made him ruler over the province of Babylon, chief prefect over the wise men. Daniel then, look at this, makes a request of the king, appoints Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of Babylon. He's bringing his boys with him. But Daniel remained at the king's court. All right, I got, I think, four lessons like, or five things that are like lessons that come out of this, and then I got four things, attributes of the kingdom, and I've got like 20 minutes left. All right, maybe 20 minutes. That's, I don't have 20 minutes. First is this, 
Lesson from Daniel. Y'all with me? We're good? God can humble anyone. God can humble anyone. The purpose of the dream is the humble Nebuchadnezzar. Right now, Nebuchadnezzar sees himself as the king who just defeated the God of the Hebrews, the God who parted the Red Sea, the God who destroyed Egypt, the God who uh, was able to bring his people out of slavery. Nebuchadnezzar, this dude, Nebuchadnezzar, thinks he's the man. In addition to that, according to earthly standards, he is the man, okay? This city that he built was ridiculous for its time. Greek historian Herodias describes the city of Babylon as the most renowned and strongest of all of its time. It had more than 90 miles of wall surrounding a city. Right? Not 90 miles of wall surrounding a city. This is 2,600 years ago. They didn't have concrete tanks. They didn't have 90 miles of wall surrounding the city. It's massive. The walls themselves were 60 feet wide, wide, enough for a four-horse chariot, you know, to take Nebi around with his boombox, spitting whatever he wanted to hear, right, around and doing 360s, 180s, skeeting around, bow, doing my thing. This is Nebi's jam. This is his kingdom, okay? The walls themselves were 375 feet high. History says that this is what is the case. 375 feet high, that's 20% higher than the Statue of Liberty. That's huge, okay? Outside the walls, the city was surrounded by deep and wide bodies of water, right? It's, it's hard to attack somebody when you got to go through, you know, 70 foot deep seas to get there, all right? In his mind, his reign may end one day because he knows all men die, but his kingdom will not end. His kids are going to rule this kingdom. His grandkids are going to rule this kingdom. He, he is powerful. He is successful. He is significant. But despite all the signs of stability, this dude is being tormented because God decided to send him a dream. And then, to make matters worse, God sends a Hebrew slave who was a teenager to make him drop to his knees with the interpretation of one dream. This bigger than life figure, this ruler, steps off of his throne and bows before a teenage Jewish exile. God can humble anyone he wants at any time he wants to humble them. The point is, no matter who you are, where you come from, how much money you got, how much power you think you have, what your fame looks like, how much influence you have, how many people you got following you on the gram or Twitter or whatever, God can humble anyone. Jesus says, everyone who exalts himself, be careful. He will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. And in the same thread, though, you can also see that God can also elevate anyone. Daniel hadn't even finished his second year of schooling. And he's already risen to one of the highest governmental officials in the empire. Right? God can elevate and humble whoever he wants, whenever he wants. And it won't be a problem for him. That should humble all of us. Second is this, God saves and preserves his people. Another lesson, the point of the interpretation <clears throat> is to save and preserve Daniel and his friends. And when Daniel and his friends are in positions of power, guess what? They probably have some empathy and sympathy for the people of God because they are a part of the people of God. And this has always been true about God. God preserves his people. It's the, the theology of this is, is called eternal security, right? It's, it's a doctrine that uh, many people have a hard time holding firm to and believing. But let's be honest here. If you could lose your salvation, hear me out on this one. If you could lose, like, like God says, anybody who's given into my hands, they cannot be taken from me. This is Jesus' words, right? If you could crawl your, out, your way out of God's hands and out of his grip, if you could lose your salvation... Ain't it true that you would? You would. 
Y'all don't want to own that? You would. You know you. If you were left to your own devices, you would do you. But he has kept you. He is the covenant keeper, not you. (laughs) You fail that covenant every day. He keeps his end. He will discipline, but he will keep you. And if it was up to you to keep you, you would not be kept. Hear that loud and clear. Your failure, though, is not what's final. Because God preserves and keeps and saves his people. Yes, you will mess up. Yes, you will miss the mark. Yes, you will sin. Yes, you will fail. And yes, you will likely have to deal with the consequences of all that. But your failures is not what is final because your God preserves his people. Third thing, confession and uh, conversion are not the same. There's a difference between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is in awe. He's overwhelmed. He's humbled. He's impressed. He's not saved. He's not converted. He's He's not seeing himself still in the right light. It is possible, hear me, it is possible to revere God, but not receive God. It is possible to elevate God and be impressed with God in your mind, but not receive God in your heart, okay? You can be impressed with a Bible verse. You can be impressed with people who follow people who are impressed with God and and, and love God. You could be, you could double click something on the gram. You can share something that, you know, on Instagram or on Facebook or wherever it is. And it's like, ah, that's a great verse. You could be impressed by verses, That does not mean Jesus is your king. You can have an emotional moment. You can have an emotional experience. You can be overwhelmed at a baptism service, right? All that. But what can that just be? That at times could just be a moment, an experience, not a transformation. And in God's kingdom, we don't judge each other based on a moment of awe or an overwhelming experience. We judge based upon the fruit of repentance in a person's life. I was once walking one way away from Jesus, and I stopped because he stopped me, and I turned, and I came to him. Why? Because he pulled me and dragged me, and there was nothing I could do to get out of it. Some of you feel that pulling. You're marked. It's coming. Fourth thing, have a crew for your crisis and stick with them. The word used in verse 17 to describe Daniel going to pray with his friends is an Aramaic word that means to follow, or it means a a fellow or a comrade, right? In Hebrew, it means joined or to tie a knot. This is the level of relationship that this dude Daniel has with these three guys. And what Daniel is doing in this is he's highlighting that relationship and that these men had each other's backs in ways that is maybe unknown to us today in the Western society. They were like brothers, yet they were not brothers. And what you see in verse 48 and 49 is is they were so close that when Daniel gets elevated uh, by the king, what is the first thing that he does? He requests that they come with him. It's really, really hard to trust people while you're elevating in life. Hear this. It's really, really, really hard to trust people as you're elevating in life because people want what you're elevating to and don't want you. And one of the safest ways to identify your true friends is by elevating those who have been sticking with you the longest, okay? The longer someone knows you, hear this, the longer someone knows you, the less likely they are to stick around. Why? Because you have problems and they're going to see them. You, you hear me? But like, like, there's a proverb, right? Like, there's a beauty in, in a brother who sticks around during adversity. Adversity. That person's more than a friend. That's like a brother. And at some point in your life, something is going to threaten your well-being. Hear me. Hear me. This is Guaranteed. Something at some point in your life is going to greatly 
harm or threaten your well-being. It could be health, it could be money, it could be a breakup, it could be a marital crisis, a bad relationship, it could be a family issue you run into, it could be problems at work, it could be big decisions you have to make. At some point, something's gonna threaten your well-being. It could be false accusations against you, it could be you made big mistakes and now people know. It could be all of a sudden your secrets are exposed, it could be some sort of addiction. The point is the same though. At some point, something's going to threaten your well-being and I promise you, What you want is you want to have identified people to walk into that problem with you. You don't want to have your crew not yet solidified when that crisis arrives. It's way easier to identify your people, your crew, before the problem arises than trying to figure out who those people are when your crisis comes and you're tempted to hide in isolation. Build your crew before your crisis comes. Who's your crew? And I'm not just talking about like people who, you know, I'm talking about within the kingdom of God. Who's going to give you kingdom advice? Who's going to stick by your side like, like we do in the kingdom that's united? Who are those people? Fifth thing, God... Uh, bless God before God blesses you. This is verse 20 and 23. In Daniel chapter, uh, in verse 20, Daniel jumps into praise. This is crazy because he believes that God has revealed the dream and interpretation to him, even though he hasn't yet stood before Nebuchadnezzar to have his dream and interpretation solidified and proven. That's nuts. Daniel has a moment with the Lord where he's like, oh, I think the Lord just gave me the, the dream and an interpretation. And before he goes and checks it out, he just stops and he's like, God, you're amazing. How good are you? I haven't even yet fully understood what it is. Like, nobody has even confirmed this has come from you. But he begins to praise God based upon what he believes God has done before God has actually done it. That's crazy. But it's a beautiful depiction of what praise actually is. One of the most powerful things about praising God is that often praise is a declaration of gratitude before God fully proves and provides to you what it is that you ought to be grateful for. That's crazy. Isn't that true, though? It does. It takes faith to praise God. And because Daniel knelt before the king of the universe in prayer and praise, he was able to then stand before the king of Babylon in power because he knew that God would preserve him through what seemed to be a humanly impossible situation. So what does he do? He starts out and he's like, yo, God, you're so good. This is impossible and you're going to do it. It's so crazy. All right, I'm going to give you four things. Now, these all run through very fast. No, five, whatever. I'm going to give you five things that are attributes of God's kingdom out of this text. Because last week we looked at the spirit of Babylon. This week we're going to look at God and his kingdom. First is this, verse 44. And in the last days, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. God's kingdom will never be destroyed. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever get a little freaked out watching the news? Come on, anybody? Be honest with me. You got like nuclear weapons, right? You've got like terrorists. You've got all sorts of stuff. Like it's, it's absolutely crazy. Middle East uh, is, is going nuts. Pandemics, interest rates, stock market, presidential candidates, none of them look great. You know, like sometimes the news can freak you out if we're just keeping it a buck. You want to know what shouldn't freak you out? Watching the History Channel. That shouldn't freak you out, right? Watching the news freak you out. Watching the History doesn't freak you out. Why? It reveals the end, but you already knew the end. It's the History Channel. A couple weeks ago, Beth and I went through an Auschwitz museum in Boston. It was super sad. It was. I'm Jewish. I have Jewish background. I have a lot of Jewish blood in my body. When I was walking through there, you know what I didn't go? Be like, yo, babe, this is freaking crazy, yo. My gosh, I'm Jewish. There's a dude named Hitler out there. I didn't do that. Why? Because I knew the end. I knew the end. And within the kingdom of God, there is nothing new. Everything's history. Think about that. The future has been made known. He's revealed it. He wins. The end of the story, the kingdom of God cannot be destroyed. And he won't be, it won't be destroyed. Okay? You also see in verse 44... It won't ever be dominated either. You're like, whoa, really? Yeah. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. The kingdom of God cannot be taken over by anybody who God does not assign to have authority in it. Do you hear that? 
Even in verse 37, Daniel, uh, it says to King Nebuchadnezzar, you're the king of whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom. Like, oh, you, you think you're over the people of God? <laughs> There's a God over you, dude. God just let you. God leased us out to you for a little bit. He just, he let that happen. And so within the kingdom of God, we got to stop worrying about how weak or worldly the church is. We got to remember that not every institution that has the name church in its name is actually a part of the kingdom. That's offensive, but it's true, right? The church has always been and will always be strong and holy and righteous and powerful and godly and blameless and protected and perfect. Like, like not perfect from the outward, like from as we look, perfect according to God's standards because he says it's perfect, period. And God's word trumps what we do. We're blameless not because we don't have things that you could blame us for. We're blameless because God says, in Christ, I make you blameless. The kingdom of God will never be dominated. Third is this, the kingdom of God will end all other kingdoms. Uh, It says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Listen, listen, there is no righteous kingdom on this planet right now apart from the kingdom of God, period. Jesus is not returning in Air Force One. We cannot pin our hopes and dreams and future on political elections or the rise and fall of the stock market or national policy or the Supreme Court. Sure, those things important. But at some point, Jesus is going to crack the sky, yo, and annihilate every earthly kingdom as he fully establishes the kingdom of God. So yes, God bless America. I know some of you, you were born here. Some of you, you immigrated here. Some of you, you trying to get out of here. That's fine. It's all good, right? I, I, and I get it. I know many, I, this, many of you, you love your country, whether it be this country or another country. Great. Love your country. Serve your country. Fight for your country. But do not worship your country. Because, listen, as much as you love your country, your country is getting the stone too. Your country's being dispersed and destroyed too when the king arrives. Fourth thing, God's kingdom is an eternal kingdom. I won't spend much time on this. Praise God that this is not the end all be all. Praise God that when you put your head down and one day it's over here, in a, it says in the, um, in the, thank you, in the blink of an eye, right? In the blink of an eye. It also says that your life is but a vapor, right? When it happens, when it happens, it's not over. New just begins. Go read Revelations 21 and 22. Fifth thing this, and I'll close with this. Jesus is the cornerstone of God's kingdom. Verse 45 says, a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and he was with God in the beginning, and all things were made through him. Nothing that is exists outside of him. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom and the stone that we see in verse 45 the stone that was thrown is Christ himself he is the cornerstone he is the rock of our salvation the main point of verse 45 is Nebuchadnezzar here's the deal you are the man right now but man is there another man coming and when that man comes, your knee will bow to that yes. man. And your name, your tongue will confess the name of that man. And what we know on this side is that name is Jesus. And what we all need to be reminded of today is that this is the history of God's kingdom. These are the attributes of God's kingdom. And Jesus is the king of God's kingdom. And if you, hear me out, if you will kneel before King Jesus today, you are guaranteed to stand with King Jesus forever. All right? Half clap. Sounds great.